It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 344 of Science on Top. Today is Monday, the 14th of October, 2019. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hello. This show is only possible thanks to the generous support from our Patreon subscribers. People like Peter Leverdink and Graham Hannigan. Each episode, they donate a few dollars and it actually goes a long way towards meeting our costs. So why not join them at scienceontop.com slash donate. Uh, and we've talked before about zebra patterns and how that can stop uh, march flies and horse flies from biting zebras that uh, camouflage stripes on them. And it turns out that also works on cows if you paint them with zebra stripes. Penny, what's going on here? I just love this because it seems so ridiculous and yet it's so utterly sensible. So as Ed said, that research that um, zebra stripes can help to sort of confuse flies and stop them biting um, has been done. And so this research team have just applied that to cattle. So this is a Japanese study and what they did is they got uh, a number of cows and um, Six cows, there we go, and some, two of them they painted stripes with white stripes like a zebra. It's mentioned that they uh, drew it freehand. Um, <laughs> they didn't have a stencil. <laughs> they didn't have a stencil. Yeah. So these, are just, these are black cows. So two were painted with white stripes, two were painted with black stripes to see if just the paint itself mm-hmm. had an impact and two were left blank. Wait, anyway, whatever. Two of them. Unpainted. Two were a blank canvas. As a control. I feel like this is the kind of study I'm going to present to my students because it's just so easy to understand, like, we painted them white. We painted them black to make sure that just the paint itself didn't have an effect and then we had some blank ones as well. Like, it's so neat. Um, And what did they find? They found that there's some... Gorgeous pictures, by the way, of painted cows in the actual paper, which is available um, open access, mm-hmm. um, that they were monitoring for fly repelling behaviours like, you know, swatting their tail or moving their head around, stamping their feet, flicking their ears. Swearing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the whole thing, wearing hats with corks. Um, <laughs> no, no, these were Japanese. I, I wish that was on the checklist. Hats. Numbers, um, uh, incidences yeah. of hats with corks. No, it's still zero. <laughs> so they, you know, they observed this and did a statistical analysis of how many fly repelling behaviours were seen and overall the most behaviours were seen in the control. A larger number of behaviours were seen in the, um, the black painted group and in the black and white treatment there were fewer fly behaviours, especially, um, oh, sorry, and also fewer flies, so number of flies as well. So it does seem that this painted um, cow pattern actually did seem to reduce the amount of fly bites and flies. So It's really interesting, though, that it was also the painted black ones had less flies. A little bit less, but... I'm not sure how significant that difference okay. was. It could be they said they didn't really investigate odour, so it could be that the aroma mm-hmm. has changed. But it's also well, possibly of, yeah. also the the paint the paint could uh, present not as black to flies because mm. their eyes are very different. Mm. So um, they you know they might actually black. see black paint. <laughs> yeah, they might see it in kind of somewhat freakishly like red colour or something yeah. because of, yeah. But I mean. Part of me was like, oh, here's an igno- here's a- next year's Nobel. <laughs> but this is actually apparently the economic impact of biting flies in the United States on cattle production. <laughs> Sorry, I just thought my yeah. picture straight away. I was thinking of people biting flies. Oh, no, no. Like flies, so <laughs> flies that bite cattle. <laughs> 2.2 billion a year. 
Wow. So really? So this is not like, oh, it's annoying. There's a blowfly in my house. So Is that because they bring disease or something? Or? Yeah, they can bring disease. They're really damaging. Um, they can also <laughs> cause, they can stop cattle from grazing, feeding and sleeping. They can also make them bunch up. So they sort of jostle for space to try and avoid the escape from the flies, which can cause stress and injury. So, yeah. And it, apparently people have noticed that, you know, horses with stripy blankets on it are less likely to have flies. But yep. no one, and this is where this research <laughs> is original, has sought to paint cattle with stripes before and see what's happening. Yeah. So or at least I don't know stripes on cattle and write it down and report it to someone. Yeah, yes, yeah, true. They or may have just painted stripes it. on them and, and not told anyone about yeah. it. Well, yeah, it may, it, it could be like, well, farmers have known about this for years. Um, uh, I don't there's think one weird trick seen. that only farmers know. <laughs> 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 but, yes, so I'm curious to one. see. I'm curious to have my time machine and think in 150 years' time. Are we going to have <laughs> genetically modified sp- stripy zebra cows? Did you <laughs> say modified? modified. <laughs> I did. I did. <laughs> or I wonder if it'll just be, you know, a whole new industry of cow painters. <laughs> Specialist cow painters. Like graffiti <laughs> artists who get commissioned yeah. to do it. We'll commission a, uh, a cow artist to paint some stripes. Although that's another thing that occurs to me is they tested no paint they tested black paint and they tested black and white stripes they didn't test white paint so oh, it so might be white, if white if the cow. whole cow is painted white we don't know if that will mm. uh, affect the flowers or not it probably I don't know if you've ever walked down a street wearing a white t-shirt in a yeah. place with lots of flies compared with people not wearing a white t-shirt the white t-shirt seem to attract flies at least on me <laughs> Sample size of one. Uh, far more yep. <laughs> than if I'm wearing a, a different coloured T-shirt. Yeah. Look, I'm not suggesting that that is likely uh, to be a, an issue because I think the theory that they're going by with this is that it's the polarised light uh, affects uh, the, how the flies see it. They see uh, only light going at certain angles. So when you have this uh, stripe pattern, it doesn't show up as well to the flies. Uh but I think it's just an, an additional step that they could do to verify that it's not just painting it all white scares off those particular flies. I don't know. Um, and it's an extension of, as you say, research that's been done before on horses and things. And we've talked on the show many years ago about uh, similar studies which were done on, I think they had wooden horses and they painted them and left them out in the field so they could easily monitor it and... I think they might have even actually had sticky glue on those horses. So they would stick, our uh, flies would stick to the horses and they would be, in, be able to count at the end of the day how many were stuck to the ones with painted stripes, how many were painted uh, to the ones that weren't painted, etc. So anyway, let's uh, move on. Anyway. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. I really wish I hadn't. Um <laughs> But no, let's now talk about a. We've we've talked about Planet Nine many times on this show as well, but this is a theory mm. that I never saw coming, and I'm not sure I fully understand it because there's a paper being published that suggests Planet Nine is not a planet, but a black hole in our solar system, which is not how I thought black holes would work. Um, basically, Planet Nine being an explanation for some odd orbits that we've noticed in very, very, very distant objects in our solar system. Is that right? Yes, trans-Neptunian objects. Mm -hmm. Things out past Neptune. Doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing. Orbiting slightly more erratically than we're expecting, I think is what you mean. Not like playing music. No, they're not being naughty. Yeah, they're not like, yeah, exactly. Just listening to, yeah, smoking drugs and stuff. No, 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 no. (laughs) Okay. Do so, you well, want to I tell mean, us about so, this. <laughs> sure. So that so so, and you're, you're spot on. That that that's been the primary um, catalyst for the search for Planet Nine is these trans-Neptunian objects doing, you know, interacting with something. There, there there appears to be something out there that is that is changing their orbital paths. Hmm. So that that's something that 
with just Newtonian physics, you don't have to go to Einstein. You can just with Newtonian physics, you can you can construct a model of the gravitational wells in our solar system as we do in order to accurately fire you know probes and stuff off to where planets are going to be in the future. Not just planets, but moons, comets. All of the other stuff that we're landing on these days, evidently we're landing on everything now. <laughs> so, so, so we have a very detailed understanding of how things move about our solar system, and that is because the physics just tell us. So, we, if we've got enough observations and we know where things are at a certain point in time, we know their mass, we know their velocity, we can figure out where they're going to be. So. As a result, we can also predict where things that we find should be later. So if we have enough data on it to say, okay, we, we, we've now plugged in uh, a relatively uh, decent understanding of their mass and of their velocity and of the, the vector, the direction they're going, we know where they should be later. And then when they're not in that place uh, and there's a bunch of other things not where they should be, you go, okay, in order for that to occur, there is another gravity well. There is something else that is perturbing their orbit. Because you remember, we don't all orbit the sun. The solar system is the all of the combined mass of everything that's in the solar system, which then orbits a common center of gravity. Mm -hmm. So things influence other things. The planets actually influence each other. Um, so... That's that's one part of it, and that's why we're looking for a planet nine because we know something is not quite right um, with these things that are way way out. But there's a second thing that's come up recently, which has come out of uh, an instrument called the optical gravitational lensing experiment, OGLE. Thank you once again, astronomers. <laughs> you guys do acronyms well, and I and I applaud you. This is the OGLE experiment. So the OGLE experiment. Its job is to find gravitational lensing events. So what are gravitational lensing? We've discussed this many, many times on the podcast. Very quick summary. Something with a lot of mass passes in front of another thing. The thing with a lot of mass can have the effect of bending light around it and can cause two very interesting outcomes. One is it can magnify the thing behind it. Think of like putting a microscope in between your eye and a leaf. The magnoscope is magnifying it. The other thing that these gravitational lensing events can do is they can cause things to appear in the sky multiple times. So you might have a particular galaxy in the distance which seems to appear twice or three times on the sky. And that's a property of the light being bent in different wavelengths around around this mass, and it's really cool. Um, it, it's it's led to all sorts of interesting discoveries. Now, this new instrument has found a lot of gravitational lensing events that are all in one specific direction. They're basically towards the galactic bulge, around eight kiloparsecs away. This is interesting because that indicates that there's something there we don't know where exactly because it's only if it passes in front of something for which we have an accurate distance estimate that we can then say well we know it's between that and us so we don't know exactly how far away it is but what we have what we can see and this is and the, the variability in this is largely because we don't know how far away it is exactly is this object which is causing the gravitational lensing events is somewhere between half an Earth, Earth mass to 20 Earth masses, which is very small for a yeah. black hole. Can now, you have black holes that small? Well, why, yes, presumably. you can. Yes, you otherwise they wouldn't theorise it. <laughs> right. So, so let's put that to the side for one moment because I'll come to, back to that question. The very interesting thing, and this is why these scientists actually wrote this paper, was the current estimate for planet nine is somewhere between five to 15 earth masses. These overlap quite significantly, mm -hmm. these two numbers. Mm -hmm. So half to 20 and five to 15, there's a huge overlap sure. in there. Yep. That is actually what clued them into the potential, the possibility that another 
uh, explanation for these trans-Neptunian objects going a little bit haywire in their orbits could be, rather than the planet, this could be a thing called a primordial black hole, which is back to your question earlier. What is a primordial black hole? So we know that a normal stellar mass black hole forms from the collapse of a supermassive star. So a really, really big star, um, so big that uh, it, it doesn't completely blow itself apart like a, a, a supernova would do. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't manage to puff off all of its mass and then collapse back into something like a neutron star. It do, it's not nowhere near small enough to become something like a white dwarf, which is what our sun will become. Instead, it's in just the right sort of uh, you know, mass range that it collapses down infinitely as the battle between light pressure and gravity finally uh, uh, ends as there's not enough material to maintain the nuclear reactions, and then gravity wins, and everything collapses down. So black holes, although, you know, in, in Hollywood and so forth, they tend to be presented as a really huge thing, they're really small. Like even like a stellar mass black holes are, are very, very small in comparison to even our sun, for example, in terms of volume. Just think of actual size, not mass, obviously, way, way, well, way bigger. And then you get some weird thing that, uh, cosmologists and astrophysicists talk about where black holes have no size or the event horizon has zero size. Well, that's right, because they are elements. actually, <laughs> yeah, for all intents and purposes, they're considered, you know, a point. Hmm. But they're really not a point. You know, they're a point <laughs> in the scale of the universe. They're not a point in, in reality because something, so, so to put this in perspective, if this was a primordial black hole and i'll get to how they form in a moment if this is a primordial black hole with with solar with a mass of around five earths for example that would be about five centimeters large in terms of the actual you know object okay. right so think of all of earth's mass times five in something around five centimeters large that's okay. a lot of mass in a very small place <laughs> yeah that certainly is so, primordial okay. black holes, how do they form? Yeah. It is thought, and these are only um, theoretical at this time. We've never observed one. We have no direct evidence for one existing. But they came out of uh, Einstein's equations. It was proposed way back in about 1966 that these things could and probably did form in the moments after the Big Bang. And they were formed because of clumps of... of um, material, clumps of gas that were, were not quite evenly spread. This is the very same thing that led to the cosmic microwave background, right? Because that's like a, 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 a structure that completely, you know, in, envelops the sky all around us. The, the whole sphere of the sky around Earth has got this blueprint on it in microwave radiation of this, this you know, unevenness of materials after the Big Bang. So these black holes could have formed with significantly less mass than our, our star and they could have formed with mass thousands of times our star. There's no real, you know, it's not, not a narrow limit of, of the size that they could have been when they formed based on how much mass they have. The original primordial of your black holes by now, the very, very smallest of those, would have completely evaporated. So if you remember Stephen Hawking's... Um, uh, Nobel Prize that was for his work in the field of um, what is now called Hawking radiation. So he he is the one who showed that it, but that um, the black physics holes of black don't holes only allows, consume; they also uh, they do radiate. They, they they emit radiation, and and that radiation over time, over an immense period of time, would mean that the black holes would actually just evaporate away. And we've also seen this in lab environments where they've been able to create you know, ridiculously small um, black holes, which annihilate. They, they basically evaporate away within milliseconds because they're so, so small. So this is a thing. We know it's a thing. And because it's a thing, it actually gives us a way to find them, which is also pretty cool. So one of the things about any kind of hypothesis that anyone makes is, is it feasible? Is it likely? And is it testable? Mm -hmm. It's testable because that very radiation is something that we can go looking for. So we've got a few instruments that could actually go looking for that radiation. 
things like the Chandra X-ray telescope is an example mm -hmm. of an instrument that actually could go looking for some of that radiation in the X-ray band. We have a few other instruments as well that could go looking for different um, uh, bands of radiation. So all of these bands of radiation are effectively light, so we can look for gamma rays, we can look for X-rays, we can look for other um, types of uh, exotic rays, and they would actually be a signpost for the existence of this primordial black hole. Now, that's important because th the authors of this paper pointed out this is every bit as likely, if we accept that primordial, primordial black holes could exist, this is every bit as likely that there would be enough of them out there that our solar system could have captured one of them in much the same way that it's proposed that it captured Planet Nine, because Planet Nine is so far out, the, the hypothesis right now is that it didn't form, or the leading hypothesis, is that it didn't form with our, with our system, which means it was a rogue planet. So it, was, it had been ejected from another star system or another star system had annihilated itself and it was left and it was roaming and then sort of wandered past and we just grabbed onto it. Right. So, so, that, so we could have equally grabbed onto a primordial black hole, which could now actually be orbiting our sun. So if I may break down all of that, <laughs> sure. this, this paper then is essentially saying that there's a probability that these primordial black holes exist and a primordial black hole is essentially a teeny tiny low mass black hole. Yes. And there's is much chance that one of those teeny tiny black holes is planet nine and at the very outskirts of our solar system, there's as much chance of that as it is of being an actual planet. Yes. Based on what I've read, it may not be that it's as much chance because we absolutely know that rogue planets exist. That's a that's Fair an point. absolute okay. surety, and we've yes. we've also got some pretty stunning estimates, which in fact we've covered on this show in some episode. Uh, we've covered in on this show the the staggering numbers of of rogue planets that that could well sure. be out there. Yep. So we know they're there. So maybe you know the chances aren't, uh, but but the chances of the of of the observed interactions being one or the other based on what we're seeing are, are pretty much the same. And that comes down to the similarity in mass between those microlensing events that we're seeing and the perturbed orbits of these trans-Neptunian objects. And that's really cool. That's I, 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 I loved this because it's, it's a case of, well, we're not saying this is it. Mm. This is just a paper exploring this possibility. And this is where... You know, this is where theoretical physics and observational physicists, you know, really come together because the, the theorists say, could be this, and then the observationalists go out and nah, look for looked. evidence of it's it. It's not that. <laughs> <laughs> um, or in the case of string theory, there's nothing for the observationists to actually observe. So they can't go looking for it. And that comes back to the testability thing that I mentioned before. Hmm. I'm just astounded at the idea of teeny tiny black holes. That's teeny tiny <laughs> well, because I've always, as you say, partly because of media representations, movies, TV shows and all that. Right. And just my understanding was that to be a black hole, you need a lot of mass. Uh, and so I just assumed that, well, there would, yeah, that if there was sure, a black hole in our solar system, it would be consuming us right now. But if they're teeny tiny, I guess not. That's it. And the thing is for, for a black hole to... Uh, exist, it doesn't need a whole lot of mass. It just needs enough mass in a small enough place. Uh, mm. It needs enough mass that it can hold itself in one place. Basically, and as I said, we've created these things in labs that then annihilate very quickly because they're so freaking small. Yeah. And no, there's no possibility we can create a black <laughs> hole in a lab that's going to then envelop the Earth because what would it be created from? Um, you know, things that are already here. So there's no change in mass of the Earth as a result of creating. Anyway, that's a whole not. That's a that's a, a beer conversation, I guess. <laughs> the best kind of conversations, right? Um, but also, I like that, as you say, we can at least test for this. We can look for this Hawking radiation, and that may be possibly even an easier method of hunting for Planet Nine than looking for a exoplanet that's very dark uh, up against you know, a dark part of the sky and very difficult to see that moving so far away. Very cool. Yep. And we've got two instruments right now that could go looking for, or two examples of instruments, which, as I mentioned, uh, the Chandra 
mm-hmm. uh, observatory and also the uh, Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. Uh, we've got yes. for it. So, so we've got a few. And then um, we also, if James Webb ever friggin' well launched, yeah. then <laughs> um, then uh, that too could be uh, a tool to look for it. But we know where to look, right? Because these micro lensing events are giving us a pointer to it's there. Whatever mm. it is, is there. We just got to point things at it and, and see. So that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Awesome. And no danger to us. And also, also, and I forgot to mention this, it also offers, if it did turn out to be a primordial black hole, the potential for scientific discoveries from one being on our doorstep like that are immense. It, it's huge because we don't not, we, we don't know of any black holes that are more than tens of light years from us. Hmm. We're talking about something that's basically, a, you know, less than a light year from us, which is, you know, the, the opportunities for observation then are, are extraordinary. Yeah. In a few thousand years, we could go and visit it. <laughs> <laughs> we could. Yeah. Oh, very yep. cool. Well, let's uh, do some archaeology and some uh, look back in time now because some bone just bones in israel in a cave in israel have been found that suggest early humans were using them as storage containers basically for food to eat later this is a, a tin can of soup essentially yeah basically bone marrow is one of those foods where i would never think mmm yum bone marrow but if <laughs> really? i'm ever in a, oh, yeah, bone if I'm no, ever in done a well very to nice eat it yeah. So good. So yeah. amazing. So it's obviously a very highly nutritious food. And as Ed said, basically it's in its own little storage container. What's interesting about this story is the age of these bones. So this is some of the earliest evidence of modern humans. So from 200,000 to about 420,000 years ago, really anticipating their future needs and saving it for later. And in some cases, perhaps weeks later. So the reason these um, specimens of bones have been found at a cave near Tel Aviv, um, Kesem Cave, um, and they have cut marks on them, which are typical or consistent with preservation and delayed consumption. Um, you can tell that the bone's been preserved and the marrow hasn't been eaten immediately because once the skin on the bones dries up, it's much harder to cut them. Um, and so you need an, a bigger effort to remove the skin. So it makes a reasonably characteristic pattern that can be analysed. And these kind of cut marks were found on 78% of the over 80,000 animal bone specimens wow. analysed. So that is a very significant number of bones, um, even over a long period of time. It's, um, it shows that these, I would think it was mainly deer, that these were an important part of their nutrition, but also that the bone marrow was able to be stored and saved for later, saved for a time when maybe it was needed. So it may have been nutritious for up to nine weeks after the animal had been killed. So it's interesting that the deer is possibly not just being eaten fresh, Mm. but consciously being stored and saved. So this idea of, you know, anticipation of future needs and it's something that is very characteristic of humans but that can be hard to find evidence for archaeologically. Yeah, I mean Especially that... Especially at this age, like, yeah. That just blows me away that we can just tell from, like, the cut marks on the mm. bone that they are possibly were used for this. Obviously, we don't know for sure. This is As just one Every hypothesis. caveat, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> But um, uh, archaeologists six- are usually pretty good at interpreting these things. Sure. Like there's a lot of, um, you know, you can really model it in with, you know, current technology and technology. Not techno- and- I was going to say, no, you can't model it with current technology. You can do it with ancient technology and see what it looks like with <laughs> current materials. And yeah. Right. Okay. So. Uh, so it's yeah. basically bone jerky. Bone, bone well, jerky. I guess the bone acts as almost, yeah, like I said, like a storage container, like a built-in storage container. So the marrow, I'm assuming it wouldn't have been delightful after nine weeks. But um, but if you're 
starving because you haven't caught a deer for Another nine deer, weeks, yeah. then, you know, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, we don't know yeah. if they... I've were. seen Man versus Wild. I know what he is. <laughs> <laughs> and what he drinks. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, like, we don't know if they were nomadic or if they uh, were hunter-gatherers or, or anything about them from a societal point of view. So it could be that this is a portable uh, way of taking your food with you as well. So Yeah, it says that they, they tended, they brought back the limbs and the skulls back to the cave, mm-hmm. whereas the rest of the carcass was kind of processed where it was killed. So, the, you know, and if you think about a deer's legs, they're not bulky. Like no. compared to the rest of the deer. So, yeah, it possibly was like a portable, you know, takeaway. I'm thinking about like the, the you know, Paleolithic, um, you know, school food. You could send your, your kids to, to paleo school with like their bone. Deer leg. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, because then, you know, it's not going to spoil and it's nutritious. Mm. No nuts. There's no nuts in it. <laughs> it's nude food. <laughs> it is and, nude food and, and it's totally paleo. Yeah, I was so you beat me to it. <laughs> but it's not vegan. It's no. not vegan, that's no. true. Yeah. yeah. I think the vegans got eaten in the paleo, though. They weren't as popular. <laughs> They weren't as popular. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, to be a vegan wasn't as popular because if you were a vegan in the paleo you, you, period, you paleolithic, you were probably prey. That's all I meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we're about done for the show now. <laughs> 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 no, wow. Okay. No, it's, uh, it's really interesting. And as I said, just amazing that from a few cuts on bones, we can extrapolate that with a reasonable degree of confidence. Very impressive. If you want to read more about that or any of the other stories we talked about on the show, just go to scienceontop.com slash 344. And a big thank you as always to our Patreon supporters helping us keep going. Go to scienceontop.com slash donate to sign up. And thank you, Penny and Lucas. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Well, we have Starliner taking to flight for the very first time and touch, touching down safely and beautifully on the desert floor. Uh, that was just incredible, Dan. It's kind of hard not to get a little bit emotional over here just watching it, but that was that was phenomenal. Initial indication is that we've had a very successful paddleboard test today. That's right. It, it went off, it lit off, and I mean, when you're standing here watching it in person, that thing's really moving when you see it get up off the pad. And then the sound hits you about five or six seconds later, you just get that rumble across the desert floor as Starliner's already streaking through the sky. Absolutely. And to see it touch down like that, now you did see touch down under two good mains, um, which is, is certainly within the bounds of the acceptable uh, uh, acceptable bounds for this particular test. We have tested with two good mains and qualification, and that is acceptable for our landing sequence. Um, so this was just incredible. It was incredible to watch this test, uh, and it was just absolutely unbelievable. We're going to take a, just a little look at a replay here. Uh, again, I hope you didn't blink. Uh, because 650 miles an hour in five seconds, uh, that thing sure did shoot off a test stand, didn't it? 